where do you want to be in 10 years? And I love 10 years because it gives us enough time to dream a little crazy. Anything is possible in 10 years, right? So where do we want to be in 10 years? And then how can we work backwards to get to where we are? If you're like, no, I want to be in this a, a different career in 10 years. I want to be traveling in 10 years. I want to be running this business in 10 years. Okay, well, how can we work backwards and start to make intentional steps today, this week, this month, this year? Living a healthy, balanced life is no small feat, especially when you're a mom. With meals to cook, laundry to load, work to do, and humans to raise, it can be easy to feel like we're in an on-again, off-again relationship with healthy living. But it doesn't have to feel this way. I believe living a healthy life has become way too complicated. What we need isn't a new plan or program telling us what to eat or how to live. We need simple, uncomplicated routines and information that's going to help us live our best, most beautiful life without rules and restrictions. Join me, Kristen Dofniak, holistic health coach, certified intuitive eating counselor, and mama of two for weekly conversations on what it means to live a healthy, balanced life, uncomplicate eating, and simplify in every area of mom life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. Kristen here, holistic health coach and your host of the podcast. I am so excited to have another fantastic guest for you today. This is one of those topics that I got a lot of response wanting to learn more about when I asked for requests for season three topics. And this is one topic I am certainly not an expert on. It's something that we have been on our own personal family journey with, but I wanted to get an expert on, especially someone that I have gotten to know and I love her style and I love how individual and personalized Sammy is when it comes to teaching about budgeting. So today, if you haven't already figured it out, we have budgeting coach Sammy Womack on with us. Sammy Womack is the budgeting coach and podcaster behind A Sunny Side Up Life. Her passion is inspiring women to live abundant lives through budgeting, intentional living, and positive thinking. And that is really the root of everything that we talk about today. So we talk about budgeting. We talk about creating a budget for your family, but not just creating a budget for your family and having it look good on paper, but creating a budget for your family that is based on your priorities. We talk about some of the popular budgeting programs and things they recommend and why Sammy doesn't believe that there's one right way to budget and how you can start figuring out how to budget in a way that works for you and your family. Sounds similar to what I talk about when it comes to food and balance, right? We talk about that as well because it all relates. It relates to our mindset around everything we do. So we talk about the heart behind budgeting, how important it is our mindset when it comes to setting goals, figuring out our priorities. And then she also talks about practical tips for budgeting in a way that works for you and your family. We talk about Christmas because the holidays are quickly approaching and how she approaches Christmas. And she talks talks about budgeting from a kind of a bird's eye view and looking at the bigger picture and how to budget in a way that helps you move towards whatever goals you might have in your life, which whether it's getting out of debt or saving for something big, which is what we're working on as a family right now. And she really, really does help you to personalize it and make it feel easy and doable. She's just such a wonderful resource, a wealth of information, and she is so positive in everything she does. So I'm so excited for you to hear this conversation. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Welcome to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. I am so excited to have you on. This is such a good topic, and I know so many people are going to find this so helpful. Yes, I'm so excited to be here and to chat with you again. This is so exciting. Yes, I had so much fun talking with you on your podcast. So it's fun to be, I mean, I guess I'm on the same side of the mic as I was before, but to uh, to be switching roles and being able to interview you um, on yes. something that I am certainly not an expert on. Yes, that's the exact same way I felt with you coming on my podcast talking about food. So we're kind of just trading off here on <laughs> being the expert on the topic. So either way, we get to chat. So it's exciting. Yes, it's so much fun. And like I told you before we started officially recording, so many people have asked me for more experts on budgeting on the podcast. And 
again, that is not my expertise. So I know that this is something that is needed, uh, especially with all of the craziness we've gone through in this whole year of 2020. A lot of people are exploring different job options. They've been laid off and then on, and they've had different financial situations. So I know that um, there's a lot of people who have, especially as we start coming into kind of the, the latter end of the year, they have big goals when it comes in, you know, to the next year, hopefully seeing what happens and all that jazz. So it'll be really good. Yeah. So I love just starting with a short icebreaker that I ask all of my guests, even though we already kind of broke the ice chatting for the last couple of minutes. <laughs> but just for the listeners, what do you drink first thing in the morning when you wake up? Oh, I always have to start with water. That is, that's my truthful answer. I'm not just saying that to sound good in front of you, but <laughs> I do have like a full bottle of water and I drink a little before bed and then I finish it when I first wake up, basically on my walk to the kitchen to get coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's> coffee. <laughs> yes. I love it. I am a water before coffee girl too, but it's very shortly before coffee. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. So I would love if we can just start by having you share with my listeners your family's story and your family's budgeting story. Where were you at the beginning of your budget journey? How did budgeting impact you? And then how did you get into teaching about budgeting? Yeah. So this has been about a six year long journey for us. We started actually in October of 2014. Um, my middle daughter was about nine months old when we started and we kind of had this rock bottom moment. Like a lot of people do, um, you kind of have, sometimes you have to hit rock bottom before you make dramatic life changes. And that was definitely us. So when she was born, we had our rock bottom moment about a couple of days before she was born. My husband was working in New York at the time. He works offshore and we're in Texas. So he had to fly home for work and we were waiting for her to be born and, you know, to kind of buy that last minute flight. So it was, I don't know, two or three days before she was born and we were buying that flight and we had no money to buy the flight, even though she was a planned baby, our most planned of all three of our kids. And we still didn't have that eight or $900 for that last minute flight. And it was this moment of me being nine months pregnant, literally sitting on the kitchen floor crying, um, wondering if my husband was going to be able to get home for the birth of our daughter, plus having a three-year-old running around in the background during all of this. So we ended up maxing out our last credit card that had available balance on it. We went over the max by a couple hundred dollars. We were like, oh, well, we'll pay the penalty. It let, it, it let the transaction go through because it was just one transaction. He got home and ended up to be okay, but then we stayed at that rock bottom, completely broke, no savings, not even available balance on our credit cards for about nine months while mm -hmm. I kind of recovered from her being born and all of that stuff. Um, and then I started, you know, you kind of start to bounce back about nine months, a year in after you have a baby and you can think straight again. And I was like, this is not okay. So I started like Googling and like, what do I do? I didn't know that this whole budgeting world was a thing. I started, I just started to make a list of like what our bills are, what our debt is. And it just kind of grew and grew from there. And, you know, then I was like, Hey, I need to share this. I didn't know again, that it was a thing that there was this whole debt-free community, that there was this whole world. And I just simply started to share on Instagram and Facebook. And now here we are, <laughs> and, you know, it was this huge, huge journey that has happened in the last six years, um, of doing all of this. And we ended up, when we added up our debt, it was almost a half a million dollars. It was 490,000, which included two houses, a piece of, um, raw commercial land. It was taxes. It was credit cards. It was medical bills. <laughs> it was all kinds of stuff. It was a huge mess and a huge mess that we honestly didn't know how out of control it had really gotten. And that is my biggest thing that I talk about now is for those, you know, those families, not to put guilt on them that sometimes things just get out of hand and sometimes you just need a fresh start. And so that's kind of where, that's kind of our story and where we are now with everything. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so I, much, so much. And I think your story is, it's so relatable. I know that we have been in, you know, we've had our own rock bottom moments when it comes to our own budgeting 
we have had to deal with a lot of legal fees when it comes to immigration because my husband is Canadian and I'm American. So I immigrated there and he immigrated here and having to, you know, borrow money and getting into a ton of credit card debt and really having to climb our way out of that step by step. But that reality check of actually adding it up and going, oh my gosh, we have accrued this much debt. It can feel really overwhelming. It can go, okay, I know what I did to get into this, but I don't know what to do to get out of it. And I think, you know, there's also a lot of women, and especially I think this is big for for moms too, because oftentimes I think moms are the ones who spend a lot of the money in the family, especially if they are stay-at-home moms or part-time working moms. Even if they are working moms, a lot of them are the ones who do the meal planning and the grocery shopping and buy the kids clothes. And not to say that dads don't also do this and aren't involved in this. And they are. I know my husband is not involved in grocery shopping because when I send him to the grocery store, our grocery bill doubles. Same. Love my husband, but he does not. That's just not. That's how we stick to our grocery budget as I go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think a lot of them have a lot of that control over the finances um, in whatever way they're contributing to. And it can feel overwhelming to go, okay, I'm trying to do all the things and I'm trying to save money or I'm, I have a big savings goal or I'm trying to pay off debt and they're just not meeting their goals and they're just feeling like they're in this place of drowning. And I feel like it can, yeah. it can almost be, it can be a really positive wake up call when they do take that time and add it up and have that awareness of, oh my goodness, this is how far we've gone wherever they are in that, but it can also be a really powerful catalyst for change like it was for you. So I'm curious. So you work with women now and you help them from this place of, I don't know what to do. Maybe they don't even know where to start when it comes to budgeting or when it comes to maybe they feel like they're drowning in debt or they're barely making ends meet, which is, I know, just a horrible feeling going, I've got kids to take care of. I've got a family and we're barely making ends meet. So where do you recommend this woman start if she's listening and she's like, okay, I need this right now? Right. Yeah. So a lot of it really, it does actually start with the mindset and the heart and, you know, all of that. We have to get over the beating ourselves up and we have to move past the guilt. And a lot of that is really hard to kind of decide that we're going to do that. So assuming that we have already done all that heart work and that mindset work, and we're ready to kind of forgive ourselves for the past mistakes, which is sometimes the biggest, I think that's a lot of why it took me so long to actually start. I needed those nine months to kind of be like, oh my gosh, we've gotten ourselves in a huge mess. Mm -hmm. I have to wrap my head around this mentally, prepare to make some big changes, things like that. So obviously do that kind of work. But once we have done that and we're ready to actually start with the budget, we simply start by setting up a budget. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be this really detailed spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be an app. You know, it doesn't have to be anything other than what you want it to be, basically. Um, So really just sit down with like a scrap piece of paper, a blank spreadsheet, something, start somewhere and realize that it it can grow, it can evolve, it doesn't have to be perfect when you first start. Um, And simply start with listing out when your paychecks come in. How often do you get paid? You know, okay, well, let's go from there. If you get paid every two weeks, maybe we should do a two-week budget. Okay, what bills fall in that two-week period? Let's list them out. When are they due? How much are they? Okay, well, how much spending money do we want during this two-week period? We're going to have groceries. We're going to have gas. We're going to have some restaurant money. We're going to have some fun money. Okay, you know, what spending categories do we want? How much do we want to allow for those things? And just really going through it piece by piece, little by little. Okay, well, after we pay our bills, after we allot our spending money, what's left over? Okay, now we know what's left over. What do we do with that leftover money? Do we set it aside for things like Christmas, kids' birthdays, car repairs, you know, things like that, which we call sinking funds? Do we set it aside in savings? Do we pay extra on debt? What are our goals? What do we do with that? And so we really just take it, take it very slowly, take it step by step, and and that's how you do it. And you just 
you let it not be perfect in the beginning. You let yourself, you know, there's going to be times where you're going to forget a bill. Probably you're going to underestimate for groceries. Probably you're not going to have some leftover some months and you're going to have to go back and work backwards. Okay. Well, we budgeted too much for restaurants. We need to cut that back, you know, and just allowing yourself to do it imperfectly and giving your per- yourself permission to do it imperfectly and just start somewhere. That's the biggest thing that I can tell women. Mm, yeah, I like that. I like the starting imperfectly because I think the overwhelm can keep us from starting and actually just doing anything and just writing those things down. And I appreciate that too because I know that my husband and I have done our budget over and over again over the years. We've done different budgeting methods and I know the last time we we went through that whole process when my husband started working for himself, when he started a company with a business partner, we're like, all right, our income is going to be very variable now. So we need to go back and look at our budget and figure out how we're going to work this with our variable income and with our, you know, you know variable paychecks and things like that. And how are we going to pay ourselves? Because we both own our own businesses and go through yeah. that whole process there were definitely bills that I forgot and just little things like, Oh, we have, we buy ABC mouse for my seven year old because it's a great little educational game and we're homeschooling. So it's nice to have something that she can go and do. And we're like, okay, at least she's learning something, but it's like 10 bucks a month. I think I I should know. I should know how much it is. It's something like that. It's like 10 bucks a month. It's not a big deal. It's not going to make or break our budget though. If you are in the place of every single dollar is, you know, you need to be very, very careful because you might not be in the best financial place right now, though $10 can matter. And so it was one of those things where I'm like, where is this off? Like, where did this $10 go when I'm, when you're really tracking things, I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot this or I forgot this. So not beating yourself up over it and going, okay, well, this is just the awareness process of knowing where my money is going. I think that's, that's so huge. Yeah. And you know, and now I am, I'm doing one-on-one coaching sessions and I was doing a session right before you and I got on this call and she's like, I feel like I have messed up, you know, this current budget period. It's such a mess. This is in the wrong place. That's in the wrong place. And I'm like, you know what? In like two, three days, when you get paid again, you get to start over fresh. Mm. whatever mistakes you made in this past two weeks. Okay. That's cool. We learned from it. You're going to start fresh. You're going to zero out your accounts. You're going to, and you'll do better next time. And that's okay. And she's like, okay, I need it. Like I needed that, you know, and it's, we don't have to do it perfectly, but doing it imperfectly, even if you forget that ABC mouse or your Spotify or whatever it Mm. is, it's better than not doing any of it right? Mm -hmm. At least you did 95% of it correctly. That's better than zero, you know, and give yourself that credit and move forward imperfectly. It's okay. Yeah. I love that you get, you get to start fresh mentality. That was really helpful and encouraging just for me right now. Thinking about (laughs) like, we haven't even, I'll be perfectly honest. We haven't done our budget for the month yet. And right now as we're recording, it is the fourth of the month. Yeah. It's the fourth of the month. Yeah, We haven't done our monthly budget and going, I know I need to sit down and do it. And I know I'm going to do it this weekend, but there's that little bit of guilt going, oh, I didn't do it before the first of the month. Like I wanted to, but that's just that reminder that we can start fresh every couple of weeks or every month. And when we make mistakes, we overspend here or we forget about this thing, then we just learn from it and we move forward. So there was something you mentioned that I want to touch on because I know what you meant when you said that, but I think a lot of people might not know what it means when you say zero out your accounts. So what does that mean when you're not zero out your accounts? So in this case for her, she was, she's probably going to have like a hundred dollars, maybe let's just say for easy math left over in her spending account. Um, she didn't spend it all. And so whenever she's starting out her new budget period, the next time I'm like, okay, if you have that hundred dollars, just lingering, do something with it. So you need to send it to your Christmas fund. You need to send it to savings. You need to pay extra on your debt, do something with it. Because if you just leave it lingering in that account, you're going to spend it on something. Eventually you're going to waste it basically. Um, So basically just going in and kind of reconciling and the way that kind of makes sense for me is like how we were taught probably when we were younger to like balance your checkbook. And a lot of us don't actually keep like a checkbook anymore. Um, But basically the same thing of how much money do I have? What is still pending? What do I need? You know, and just kind of reconciling all of that and letting it be a fresh start. Even if it is the seventh of the month or something, 
you get to have a fresh start every single time you have a new paycheck. And that's amazing. You don't have to wait till a new year or even a new month. You can, every single paycheck gets to be a fresh start. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And that was something that was really powerful for us in our own budgeting journey. So I mentioned to you before we got on that, you know, early on in our marriage, especially we accrued a ton of debt, especially a ton of consumer debt. We both got credit cards. We were young. I was 21. My husband was 23 when we got married. So we were basically still kids. And we, though both of our parents definitely did teach us some about money and it wasn't something that came naturally to us because I think it is a skill that's learned and Mm -hmm. we accrued a ton of debt and we had to really break a lot of the habits of, you know, what we were, how we were spending. And we decided to get rid of all of our credit cards for a period of time. Now both our businesses have credit cards, but those are, we don't even have any personal credit cards anymore. We spend what we have. But something that was really powerful for us was like really taking the money that we have and giving all of it a place, if that makes sense. So that kind of zeroing it out going, okay, there is a hundred dollars left. This needs to go somewhere and not just going, I've got a hundred dollars. I'm going to spend it. (laughs) And so when previously we would just, if we wanted a thing, we would just put it on a credit card. And that's why we accrued credit card debt. And it took us a long time to get rid of that debt because of those mistakes. We can make the same mistakes when we're like, oh, I've got this extra money, but we have goals and we want to save money and we have, and so we don't just want to be frivolous, frivolously spending that money because it feels like, oh, it's extra, but I mean, where it is extra if it's left over at the end of the month, but there are things like, yeah, you have goals, and savings and our goals. Yeah. So mo- moving towards that and putting that money towards that rather than just going, oh, I can go in on a little mini target shopping spree with this and extra you know, money. You can, and mm-hmm. that's, that's what is so powerful. And also you can budget that money in, in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I am a very big advocate of like, if you're going to go out to restaurants, be honest that you're, that's yeah. what you're going to do. Obviously don't overkill, you know, obviously don't go crazy with it, but we all go out to eat. Like mm-hmm. everyone does, even if it's just like once a week or something, everyone does. So budget that in. What is realistic for you? And I will have clients who, you know, maybe their husband works outside the home and he eats out lunch every single day and they will like apologize to me about it. And I'm like, I don't care. I mean, put it in your budget. If he's going to go and spend five or $10 every day, and that's a priority for you guys, put it in there, be honest and set that money aside for it. It's better than pretending like it doesn't happen. And Mm -hmm. then your bank account overdrawing or like you having to put that on a credit card or hurting your long-term goals, you know? So it's a lot of, that is, I think so much of the heart work that goes into it is you've got to get real honest with yourself about a lot of things. You've got to get real honest about how much you really do spend on food, how much you do really waste at Target or, you know, things like that. So be honest with yourself when you're doing this as well. And then say, I know that realistically I do spend a hundred dollars a week on restaurants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you happy with that or not? If you're not happy with it, then that's another story. Mm -hmm. Then we need to work on cutting it back, you know? And so just kind of go from there. Yes. Yeah. I think that intentionality makes it so different. And I love that your approach is very individual and it is, it's, it's guilt-free. It's like, if you want to eat out at lunch every single day, that's okay. Just don't hide it. Like you said, or don't act like it's not there. Go, no, this is something that's a priority. And, you know, in all of the, you know, budgeting episodes and, and things like that, that I've listened on your podcast. So if I'm going to mention it at the beginning of this episode, (laughs) obviously that, you know, your podcast is awesome. We already mentioned that I was on your podcast as well. You have a ton of tips on your podcast, but I love that everything is very much, you know, it is, this is about you and your priorities. It's not about you creating the budget for them and saying, these are what your priorities should be. It's about you allowing them to prioritize for them. For us, I know that our weekly date nights are a priority. So we set that money aside to either go out to eat or get takeout because we like spending that time. And because I do cook the other six meals of the week or five to six meals of the week, I like having a break. 
and it's, and my husband doesn't like to cook and he's not the greatest cook either. So we would rather go out and have somebody serve us <laughs> rather yeah. than having it feel burdensome. Cause we're like, no, this is supposed to be light. And, and we don't actually do it every single week because my husband also goes away quite a bit. So when he's away, we're not having our date night, but when he's around, I'm, we are certainly having that date night. So for Thank us, <laughs> that is important in our budget. Like it has to be a part of our budget. And I know when we first started our personal budgeting journey, we had the mindset that we had to cut out everything mm -hmm. fun. And I think part of it was the system that we were using that tells you that in order to, the, just the one that we were using told us that in order to get to our goals, we had to like the rice and beans and tuna. And I'm yeah. like, uh, I am a chef and a foodie and I eat intuitively. Like I can't just rice and beans and tuna all day long. I need something more. It needs to be satisfying. And so that was a struggle for us. And then we were, we would cut out every last thing and we're like, okay, hey, we're not doing date nights this month. And we're not buying any extra bars of chocolate that you like to have in the evening when you're watching Netflix. And it was just so miserable. So I love the idea of we can still work towards our goals. We can still have a budget, but we can prioritize the things that are important to us. Yeah. And it's that balance. And it's like, if you spend, you know, a hundred dollars a week on a date night, for example, and it ends up costing you $5,000 over the course of the year, are you okay with it slowing your debt payoff? by $5,000. Are you okay mm -hmm. with it slowing your savings goals by $5,000? I mean, you have to think about it big term. And if you're like, yeah, you know, our date nights are that important to us or eh, they're still important, but they're not quite that important. So you think, well, let's just cut that budget back to 50. Yeah. I'm okay with it slowing us down $2,500. That mm -hmm. doesn't sound too bad at all. And so you, you know, you find that balance for yourself and you find that balance with like your groceries and you're like, okay, maybe we are kind of overdoing it with the snacks, but like, otherwise I'd like to have the organic meat and the things that are a little bit more expensive. So where can mm -hmm. I find that balance, which is a lot of what you talk about with food. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I think everyone usually, you can relate money so much to food mm -hmm. and like dieting and all of that. And I really like that. So it's, it's a lot of the balance, which is exactly what you talk about. And I'm sure your audience is very familiar with how you relate balance with your food. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same thing with your money. Yes. You know, it's that, it's that intuitive. It's that finding that balance. It's that guilt free. It's all of that. Take all those metaphors and apply it to money and you're going to be right on track. <laughs> Yes. No, I love that so much. And I can definitely see those patterns in my life and our life too, yeah. in the overdoing it with the food, with the food, well, with food and with yeah. money, when we were restricting ourselves and not allowing ourselves to have any date nights or any fun. And then all of a sudden, so my, um, you know, both my husband and I own our own businesses now, but he's always had kind of a side gig doing some professional sailing along with his corporate job that he worked at for a decade. So his extra money was, you know, or his extra jobs were extra money for us. So for a long time there, it would be like, we've got extra money. And because we were trying so hard to meet our goals when it came to our budgeting and paying off our debt, it was like, we're just going to go and blow this extra money. And, and I look back and I'm like, you know how much faster we would have paid off our debt if we had just put all of that or most of it, you know, prioritizing going, okay, how much of this is important to us to spend on this thing like to yeah so like looking at it from that place of being really intentional with that money instead of just blowing it and having that like diet mindset and the binge restrict mindset around it um but actually being intentional and going okay are these things that we really want and that are really important to us and that are okay with slowing down that debt payment and things like that and right now we're kind of in a a different place now where we are working towards, instead of working on paying off debt, we are working towards a big savings goal. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at things from the, the place of, we want this thing to happen. We want to save this amount of money in this amount of time. So the choices that we make are based on, are we going to be able to get to this goal when we want to get to it? Same thing, just, you know, debt versus savings. Yeah. So yeah, I think it, it totally relates and I can definitely see that, that pattern in my own life. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so when 
So if you're working with someone and you're going through their budget and they are in a place of, I know a lot of women will relate to this, consistently going over in different categories and they realize that, okay, this is a problem. We're either overdrafting or I'm just, we don't have enough to save or to pay off debt or whatever. And I want to make this adjustment. This might be a priority for me, but maybe not this much. (laughs) Like you said with the date night, okay, maybe I'm okay with the $2,500 hit versus the 5,000. So are there, specific places where you recommend them starting to take a look at, to cut back at, or how do they figure out, okay, where should I cut back if I am working on either a debt or a savings goal? Yeah. So basically when you have your budget all laid out, like I talked about earlier, you have your bills laid out, you know what's due, you know how much is due, same thing with your spending categories, then you can go back and kind of Go over it with a fine tooth comb in a way and look at your bills. What can we lower? You know, can we switch cell phone providers? Can we switch insurance providers? Can we call and get a promotional discount on our internet? You know, things like that. Where can we cut back? Or are there things in there that we don't really need? Are there subscriptions that we don't really use? You know, what can we, what can we do there? And then you can kind of do the same thing with your spending, you know, if you're paying attention and after you start tracking for a while, you're going to get a good general idea of what you normally spend on groceries, what you normally spend on restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go back and kind of say like with the date nights, yeah, we're kind of overdoing it. We need to rein it back in. And also I say similar to the food restrictions and all of that, you don't have to do it all at once. It doesn't have to go from a hundred dollar date nights to $20 date nights, you can find a happy medium and you can also kind of wean yourself off of it. This is really my biggest tip for people with their groceries and their restaurant budget. If you are used to spending a certain amount, that's going to be a little bit of a habit to break. So Mm -hmm. you can wean yourself off of it. You can go down $10 at a time. You know, you can go down $50 $50 and then wait a couple more weeks and go down another $50. You don't have to do it. You don't have to cut it in half right from the get go. You can, I mean, maybe that's just the kind of person you are and that motivates you, but most people they're going to go into shock mode if you try to cut the restaurant budget in half. So it's okay to kind of wean yourself off of it and think about your long-term goals. Like we talked about with the date night um, and kind of focus on, okay, well, what could I be saving if I did this? And I think that really helps people because numbers themselves usually don't have an emotion attached to them unless you give them an emotion. Mm -hmm. So if you say, we're going to cut our date nights back, that's going to increase our debt payoff by 2000 over the course of this year, all of a sudden you're motivated, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't give it that long-term goal, all you're going to see right now is what you're lacking. You're not going to see what you're gaining in the long term. So I like to, you know, zoom out, focus. Well, if we do cut back on this thing, where can it get us? Where, where will we be six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, you know, things like that. So I really, really like to zoom out as well. And that really gives people that motivation. You're like, okay, actually I can go without restaurants because I'm going to be debt free in two years. I can actually do that, you know? And so there's a lot, a lot that goes into it, but again, you know, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of going through it and letting it not be perfect and continuing to check back in, continuing to re-examine and all of that. Yes. Oh my goodness. I am, you can see me like nodding along yes. with you going, <laughs> I love that, you know, it can be, it's okay. And this is just kind of like a light bulb moment for me over here too. When I talk to women about creating habits, when they want to bring more healthy foods into their life, right? And start eating more real whole foods. And, you know, they're in this, I talk a lot about intuitive eating, but there's also that gentle nutrition part of things where if they're like, okay, I'm, I know how to tune into my body. So using that as like, the, I already know how to budget, Yeah, but I want to start making some changes here. It's taking those like small, teeny tiny steps one at a time towards the goal of overall and looking at that bigger picture. And I want to feel good and I want to live a long time for my kids or when it comes to health. And then when it comes to that budgeting, I really like that. It's okay to just make it like a $10 difference next week or next month versus 
I know I am definitely of the mindset and what I've done in the past is like, we've got to get our grocery budget in order. So I'm going to cut it in half for the month. And then of course you go over and then I beat myself up and I'm like, okay, well maybe that's just not enough. But if I went back 10, 20, 30, I would probably, it'd be a lot easier or now at this point we have a sweet spot where we're really comfortable with her, but it's, it's taken time and it probably would have been a lot easier and a lot less stressful to just take it one small step at a time to find that sweet spot instead of just trying to go all in when it came to that. So yeah. And it's, you know, it's the same thing back with your food with the same thing that you say with your food, you know, you don't have to just switch next week to everything is healthy. Everything is organic. Everything is, you know, perfect. Mm -hmm. You can do it one ingredient at a time, one, you know, one meal at a time, replacing a snack with something healthier, like one little thing at a time. And, and that is progress. And sometimes Mm -hmm. we feel like it isn't because it's so slow, but lasting real true change actually does happen pretty slow. (laughs) Yes. It's those slow changes that add up. And then you look back and you're like, wow, I have made some really big changes. And yeah, I love that you zoom out too. And I'm sure this is something that is really, really powerful when you work with your one-on-one clients, because I can even think of the mindset shift that happened for our family when we made a decision this past June to really move forward on a big goal that we've had for a really long time, but it's actually coming into fruition. And so I said, I might mention it, but I might not just because I'm not sure if my husband wants me to to quite mention our plans yet, because it's not happening until spring of next year, but we have a big savings goal and something that we're working towards. And as soon as we made that a, yes, this is definitely going to happen. We opened a new savings account so we could start transferring money in to that specific savings account. We're like, no, we are going for this. My whole mindset around spending money shifted because I'm looking at this big picture and this is only a one-year goal. We're not even talking about, you know, five or 10 years down the line. We're talking about, all right, in a year, this is where we want to be. This is this big thing that we want to buy. We're working towards it. And then it was everything. I remember going to TJ Maxx and I can't even remember what I was going there to pick up, but I was kind of, you know, browsing in the the cooking section and looking at some dishes. I'm like, oh, those would be cute for food photography. And I was like, no, I don't need to spend that extra money because I don't need it. I am going, I have this bigger goal. And so it really helped kind of reel in my spending. And when we do our budget now, we're like, okay, is this helping us move towards this goal and this life that we want to live? So I think that is, it's so important. And I just, that came to me as I was noticing that big mindset shift, just focusing on the big picture. Oh yeah. And when I, when I help my one-on-one clients, you know, we'll, we'll set everything up and we'll have, you know, maybe two or three meetings and then we'll kind of start to, okay, let's plug all these numbers in. Let's see when you could be debt free. Let's see when you could hit that savings goal. You know, some of my clients, their, their goals revolve around, they want to change their career in two or three years. Okay. Well, they can hustle really a lot harder when they know that they're going to change careers in two or three years because they have such a heartfelt goal in mind. And it's, you know, it's like I said, like numbers are so arbitrary, but when we give them meaning, when we give them purpose, when we give them heart, then they actually matter. So like you guys with your savings goal, you have that purpose and now everything leads to that. And it's like, everything that we do makes more sense when we, when we zoom out and when we give it a purpose and we give it heart. And so that's what I always try to remind people. Why are you doing it? Why? Cause if you don't know why, when it gets hard, you're going to quit. Mm-hmm. So let's give it a why let's give it a purpose. Let's give it some heart. And all of a sudden you're super motivated. It's that easy. Yes. Yeah. And I, I love that you are so much around mindset kind of even before or at the same time as the actual budget and the actual numbers. Um, So I have jumped into your little money mindset course, Magic and Money, I think it's called. And it's great. And you really do work so much on the mindset. And I think that that is the piece that a lot of people are missing when it comes to budgeting because budgeting is not the most exciting thing. It really isn't. It is, it can be very dry and you're like, I'm just staring at a bunch of numbers and I don't really want to know. (laughs) I would rather (laughs) just spend the money and have it because it's just endless, right? Money is just endless in our account. We could just spend it on whatever we want, whatever, right? 
I wish. I know that's not the yeah. case for the vast majority of people. And if somebody's listening to this, chances are that is not the case for them. Right. So, it, but having that mindset and having that big picture does really create that motivation. And that's so powerful. I love that so much. So I would love to, and you've mentioned a lot of these things already, but I would like to talk a little bit about what makes your budgeting method unique and what makes it different from what maybe some of the other finance teachers are talking about. So where do you maybe differ from some other financial teachers and, and how do you think that can help the woman who's listening maybe shift her mindset a little bit around budgeting? Yeah. So like you said earlier, I, I really do try to make it unique to each person. And I really, I want people to be living their best life, not my best life, not someone else's, but like your best life and your priorities are different than mine. So it goes back to what are your priorities, you know, really focusing in. And that's where a lot of the heart work really comes in. And it almost turns into a therapy session of, well, what do I really want out of my life? (laughs) You know, what is really important? And I believe that personal finance should be personal. And so, hey, if you want to have restaurant money, do it. Like if you want to pay someone to clean your house, do it. You know, if you want to go on a vacation every single year, do it. I mean, you do you. Um, but just make sure that it is aligning with your bigger purpose, with your bigger goals. And so I will never tell anyone that their emergency fund has to be a certain amount of money. I have clients that will go all the way from a thousand dollars to ten thousand, fifty thousand. One of my clients, their goal for their for their emergency fund is fifty thousand dollars because that's what kind of pain factor they have. And that's how, how uh, much their income could change. And they don't, you know, they don't feel that secure with their income. So they're like, I will sleep good at night if I have $50,000 in my savings account. And this other person is like, a thousand is plenty. You know, <laughs> we're, we both work. We both have super secure jobs. We're good. So it can, it can vary anywhere from anywhere in there. And I'm not going to guilt or shame any of those people because everyone's lives are different. Everyone's priorities are different. Everyone's pain sensitiveness is different. So definitely making it personal and not putting a one size fits all kind of routine on anyone. I think that's so crucial. Yes, that was definitely a mistake that we made in the beginning was just trying to follow a cookie cutter plan. And I mean, it's so funny when we're relating it back to food too, because that's exactly the opposite of what I tell people to do when it comes to with cookie cutter plans don't work or they work, but they don't last because it's someone else's goal and someone else's method. Yeah. Like it might be a good starting off point, Mm -hmm. but let it grow and evolve and adapt it to yourself. And that's, that's where I see a lot of people making mistakes is they, they're not, they're not realistic. They're not putting their own spin on it. And yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, having somebody for guidance, like you sitting down and going, okay, this is how you budget and going through and figuring your budgeting method out and, you know, really working through that and having that sort of template, but then being able to apply it to yourself. I think that's really, really, really important. So I like that a lot. And I I like that you're very individual in that because there's, there's a million finance courses out there or classes. And we took one finance class twice and we couldn't figure out why it didn't work the first time around. And then we did it again and we learned some more stuff the second time around. And then we realized that it was because there were just some parts of it that weren't working for our life. I know we mentioned before something that my husband and I, uh, before we got on, that something my husband and I tried to do for a long time was use cash for mm-hmm. all of our purchases. And whereas we did pay off and there, there are you know several finance experts that, that, um, almost demand that like that is what you have to do in order to feel that money or feel the money leaving your hand or whatever. And for us, that didn't work because we would just spend all of the cash and then switch right back to our card. And we had gotten rid of our credit cards at that point. So, I mean, and it almost was more of a hit in that case, right? Because we're like, oh, this is coming directly from our bank account. This isn't magic money that we have to pay off later. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> this is real money leaving our account. And even though we budgeted 
let's use a hundred dollars as a round amount for this one thing. Oh, I spent 110 because I put it on the card and that's, yeah. So it, that did not work for yeah. us. And we kept trying to do it because we were so sure that this is what we had to do. And recognizing that this is just not what works for us and being able to personalize it for us in a way that works for us has been so freeing. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, like, does cash work for you? Yes or no. Like some people it does for me. It doesn't debit cards are like, I can see every single penny. I can see it adding up. I never lose a receipt this way. You know, if you're doing cash, you've got to keep up with that change. You've got to keep up with the receipts Mm -hmm. and that doesn't work for me. I don't feel a pain factor when I hand someone cash because I'm just going to go home and toss that change in our change jar and you know, but I, I feel it when I do the debit card and some people are the opposite. Um, and other people do use credit cards responsibly and they do do the travel hacking and that like, if you can do it responsibly, good for you, you know, you do you. So I will tell people you can do a combination of all three. I don't care as long as you are being intentional with it, you know, and Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who will do a combination of debit and cash, Um, especially like they'll do each spouse will get their, their spending money, their fun money or whatever in cash. And then they don't have to like answer to each other. They have that cash. You spend it however you want. Don't spend it. I don't care. There you go. You know, and then they do like the family spending on the debit card or, you know, they do some kind of combination that works too. Like it's all about trial and error. It's all about figuring out what actually works for you and then going with that. If you figure out it doesn't work for you, there's no pain for me when I use cash, stop using cash. It's that like, it's that simple. Yes. Yeah. And I like that you make it simple, that it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have to be one way. And it, <laughs> is, it can feel like such a struggle when it does feel like you're just trying to do this thing and it is not working. And right. It's the same thing going back to the dieting type thing. You can do it your own way. It doesn't have to yeah. be, you don't have to follow this just because somebody told you this is the way that it's supposed to be. I know something that we used to do with cash. Another thing that we did, it's just so terrible because it just didn't work for us. And it does work for people. I know people in my personal life who use all cash because that works really well for them. Yeah. So I I love that you're not like, no, no cash ever, or no, no credit cards ever. It's like, no, what, what works for you? How can you be responsible with this? Cause we would have the cash envelopes and I would run out from one and I would either use the card or I would like take from the other envelope. And then I would go into the other envelope and go, where did this money go? Yeah. Cause I would lose a receipt or something. And it was just too much to track. And something that we ended up doing when it comes to like our personal fun money too, is we each got our own debit card that is just ours. And so we have our joint account and that's where all of our main bills come from. And we put money, we both put money from our own businesses into that. And that's our income and our main, like all of our main bills come out of that account. And then we also have our individual accounts where like, okay, this is your spending money. You can spend it on whatever. And then we also have a couple savings accounts as well that things go into, but just being able to have that card and go, I've got to be responsible with this because if I want to save for something myself, or I want to spend this on this thing that's important to me, then I have that money there and it's in a card too. So if I want to buy something on Amazon, I'm not going to use cash to buy something on Amazon. I would take my fun money and go to the bank to put it into the account so that I could buy something on Amazon. It was just ridiculous. So that that, for me, that was ridiculous. For someone else, that might be what they need to do to stay on track. So I appreciate that you are very supportive of different ways, different ways for different people. We both have credit cards for our businesses because our businesses do need to make some larger expenses sometimes, but we pay pay those cards off and we're very responsible with that. Um, And we obviously don't want to be making business purchases on our personal account. So we're like, okay, this is a decision that we both made and for our own. So we've, we've kind of found our own way in that too. So I really, really appreciate that your approach is so, so individual and all. You know, and I do with the individual too, as far as digital or handwritten. That's another thing that I see people like they just pick one or the other or like an app versus a spreadsheet or, you know, things like that. So there are different ways to actually physically do your budget. Mm -hmm. And I have had some clients that, you know, we started doing it digitally because I have a digital 
system that I offer for sale and it's amazing. And it's, it has all these formulas built into it and it does so much math for you and it, all of that. Um, but sometimes that's too complicated. And, and sometimes my clients will spend more time fighting with the spreadsheet than actually even worrying about their numbers. And I'm like, you know what, you know what, scrap the spreadsheet. I'm going to get you a printable. You're going to just print this out and just write, write your stuff in there. Just real simple, get back to a pencil. And that's, you know, they just need that. Mm -hmm. And that might not be forever. And like I did my budget handwritten for probably the first three or four years until I switched to doing a spreadsheet because I need, I was such a beginner at it that I needed that. I needed that pencil in my hand. I needed to physically add up the numbers and that's what worked for me. Other people, they're like, if I write it, I'm not going to add it up. I'm not going to do it right. I need a spreadsheet to add it for me. So that's another thing that goes into the trial and error. If it hasn't been working handwritten, try digital or vice versa. So really it's, it's so much trial and error. <laughs> yes. But I, I do think that that is so comforting for the woman listening who feels like she's been trying to do it one way and that she yeah. has to do it that way. That try you can the try opposite it. way. Try it the opposite way. See yeah. what works. It's funny as you're saying this, I budget both ways. I use a digital system. We have an app that my husband and I use together because he is all digital. His, yes. his, his mind is digital. <laughs> Everything, yes. Everything's digital for him. Um, and so I like doing things on paper because I like writing it down and adding yes. it up and doing things that way. And that just, that just works for my brain. I still have a paper planner, but we also have a Google calendar that we share. So we yes. do the same thing in both. And it seems like it's extra, it's extra complicated, but it really isn't. Cause once I got into a routine of it, that's just it. That's what if works, it works for, for you. So then do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was like, once I got to, I was trying to do just digital and it was frustrating me so much. And I would still be like writing things over here and then have the digital system over here. And it wasn't really working because it wasn't, it wasn't all adding up and I was getting so frustrated. And I was like, wait a second, what if I just do it out this way? And then I just transfer it over here so we can be on the same page. And that was something that was really important for us to just in our marriage is to be on the same page with our budget because yes. my husband goes away so often he just doesn't have the time to keep up with the budget. Like I always have, it's just always, that has been my main thing is that I have managed our budget and our family, but he needed to get on board too. So we could get on board with goals and being on the same page. So having to, we had to find a system that works for both of us so that we could be on the same page with things. So we could work together at this because it's our money and we, we really yeah. needed to be on the same page with that. So sometimes all it is, is just having a system that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I want to dig into a budgeting topic that is very pertinent for the time of the year that it's going to be when this launches. It's a little bit earlier now, but the holidays are rapidly approaching when this airs. So I want to talk a little bit about some of your strategies for Christmas for the holidays on a budget. So I know that, you know, obviously saving in advance for things like Christmas presents, and it might be a little bit late for something like that. I still want your advice on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to the holiday season as a whole, I feel like it can be a huge money suck. So what is your advice for Christmas and the whole holiday season on a budget? Yeah. So like you said, it might be a little late to maybe have your savings exactly where you want it. But ideally, so maybe you like, again, we're learning as we go. It's okay if this Christmas wasn't perfect. Maybe we learned some lessons and next year is better. So ideally, you would save for Christmas all year long or maybe, you know, six months or something. You would save for it ahead of time. So that's where you would do something like what we call a sinking fund where the sinking fund basically comes from the term where you're going to sink a little bit of money into it a little by little. So you would take, for example, $1,200 is what you want to spend on Christmas. So you get paid monthly. You would put $100 a month in your Christmas sinking fund. And you can do that however you want. It doesn't have to be exactly those numbers. Um, and you would save for it as you go. And ideally, we don't want to go into debt for Christmas. We don't want to hurt our long-term goals. We don't want to, you know, borrow from that money that we have set aside for our other savings goals, ideally things like that. Um, so what we would do is basically figure out how much you want to spend. And that's again, you know, if we haven't been tracking this and a lot of my clients come to this conclusion, I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to spend for Christmas? They go, I don't know. 
you know, because they've just been swiping their credit card or buying things here and there throughout the year and not really keeping up with the totals. So let's figure out how much we want to spend. And then, okay, yeah, we decided we have done the hundred dollars a month. We have $1,200. Awesome. How do we spend that? So that's where we want to break it down even farther. We want to divvy it up for all the people that we know we want to shop for. We want to shop for each, you know, each one of our parents. We want to shop for all of our kids, each other, whatever it is. Make your whole list of 20 or 30 people that you probably have on your list. And how are we going to spend this money? You know, and then take that piece of paper with you or keep it on your phone notes or something and take that with you when you're shopping. And that's what I do. I'm a really big Black Friday shopper only because I love the excitement of the Black Friday. I love like my sister and I, we love to shop on no sleep on Black Friday. Like it's just our fun thing. Um, and also like side note, you can still love shopping and be on a budget. So just <laughs> disclaimer for anyone mm -hmm. listening. And I will keep that list in my back pocket the whole time while we're shopping. And so I'm remembering who I'm shopping for, what I had an idea for a gift. I'm keeping up with my totals as I go and things like that. Um, and I think, again, you know, it's really important to put it in perspective and zoom out. You know, remember that there is, we get, we get wrapped up in that holiday magic, right? We get in those stores, they have the music playing, it's warm. Maybe we're like me on low sleep with our sister, just having fun <laughs> shopping and we get a little crazy with it, but we have to keep it in perspective and think big picture. We don't want our January self to be mad at our November or December self for what we did. Right? So we want to think, okay, it is going to be January. I don't want to regret this per these purchases. Let's put it in perspective. And then if your budget is really tight, maybe you started late in the game, you know, it's November and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have any money saved. I'm going to have to just make it up as I go. That's where let's try to get creative. Like you don't have to go into debt for Christmas. Maybe this is the year that you just Give your coworkers some cookies instead of buying them $20 soaps from the mall or, you know, whatever. You get creative and do a, a family gift exchange where you do like a secret Santa instead of buying every single person something, you know, and get creative from that. And obviously there's so much more to it. And I have a whole blog series. I have a whole Christmas series that I'm going to be doing on my YouTube channel. And so I'll give way more tips than that, but that's really like the short cliff note version of what I think you should do for Christmas. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love that you said that you don't have to go into debt for Christmas. I think so many people have this idea that this is just inevitable that they're going yeah. to spend all of this money and it's going to be crazy. And I know it's still something that we've had to work on over the years and kind of hone in on our strategy. And we try and keep a sinking fund and we're not always good at keeping up with it, but we do try to have some savings before the Christmas season starts and then go, okay, this is what we have and this is what we're going to spend. And like you said, be okay with you know, just doing what you can and not, it doesn't have to be this big thing. We've gotten so simple with our kids too, especially because we don't live in a big place yeah. and we are downsizing much smaller next year. And mm -hmm. so we don't want to have a lot of stuff around. I'm just a minimalist by nature. I don't love having a ton of things and I would rather do things like experiences or so we don't go crazy with our kids in terms of buying them a ton of stuff. And that's, everyone is different in the way that they approach Christmas. And if you like the, you know, dozens of little presents and those type of things, and I, that's totally, I'm cool with that too. Everyone is, is definitely different when it comes to, for us, we like to keep it simple, but there was definitely some guilt around sticking to a budget for Christmas and like feeling like by sticking to a budget, I was going to make other people feel bad or something, you know, for, or that, you know, people would judge me for having a simple Christmas with my kids or my husband and I usually do, if we do a gift at all, um, what we've done over the past couple of years is, is usually do like a special date night for the two mm -hmm. of us. So we spend a little bit extra. We go to a really nice place and well, not really nice, but a nicer place than we normally would. And we just have a really nice night and we're like, okay, forget presents. We'll do stockings for each other. Yeah. And then that's what we do because we keep it simple. We keep it budget friendly and realizing that it's, 
it needs to align with our goals and our values and we can still gift people things and we can still bake them cookies or do homemade things. I'm very thankful for my ability to make delicious food because I can gift those type of things. To I people. would rather have food than something that's going to be collecting dust in a couple of months yes. anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that's exactly. So, I mean, everyone's different in the way they approach it, but knowing yeah. that you don't have to go into debt, that this season can be aligned with what you care about and your priorities and your family. And it really is, it's about the season as a whole and spending that time with family and friends and, you know, whatever it looks like this year, that's really the heart of it. It's not the gifts and and having, I think that comes back to that mindset, right? Having the mindset of, I don't have to go into debt. This can work. This can work with me and for our goals instead of it being something that just feels like this big financial burden every year. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. It was such a good reminder though to keep working on that Christmas sinking fund because that is yeah. something that we've uh we we are not always the best. I'll be completely honest with we're like, oh, we didn't put money in the Christmas fund this month. Whoops. And then it yeah. comes Christmas time, we're like, mm, I would have wished we'd saved a little bit more. <laughs> That's something, you know, next year we can do better. And mm. what I tell a lot of my clients is I have a separate line on their budget for those sinking funds. And it's not just Christmas, it's clothes, it's car repairs, it's gifts, like throughout the rest of the year. And we basically treat them like a bill. Mm -hmm. I mean, we treat them like we put it on there. We have a due date and we send that money to a separate account. And that sinking fund, again, it could be whatever you want. It could be cash. It could be a debit card. I personally do a debit card. I have a whole nother debit card account for my sinking funds. Cause when I'm mm-hmm. Christmas shopping, I want a debit card just why right. yes. Or it could be a savings account. And then when it is Christmas shopping time, you just simply transfer that money over into whatever, wherever you have your debit card or you pull it out in cash. Um, but we put that line item on the budget. We give it a due date. We give it an amount. It's not always this, you know, sometimes we can only afford $50 other months. We can afford 200. It's, you know, it can fluctuate, but we put it on there and we make sure that we are accounting for those type of things and that we are, you know, putting them in there and by literally listing them and giving them a due date as if they're a bill, it holds us so much more accountable. I love that piece of advice. I I need to make it more like a bill too, other than a, we're just going to put a little bit in every month, but having an actual number and going, this is one of our bills because we are going to feel a lot better come Black Friday or the beginning of December, whenever we want to shop start our shopping. My husband is so funny and he refuses to do any Christmas shopping before December 1st. So I will do the Black Friday shopping and I will go and online typically, but I'll do that Black Friday shopping and I'll wake up early in the morning to see the Amazon sales and things like that. But he is like, no, not until December. Not until December 1st. He lets me, thankfully. He's not like, you can't. He just won't do it himself. My husband just like, he's like, you just do it. Just put yes. my name on it. I don't care. Like whatever. He knows that I get so much joy out of it. And it's almost more of a Christmas present to me to let me go Black Friday shopping with no kids and yes. be with my sister for the day and like drink too much coffee and do all that. That's my Christmas. Like you don't have to buy me anything. Just let me go. <laughs> Just let me go shopping. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I love that you mentioned that you love to shop and you are still a budgeting expert and you still help women you know, really figure out a good budget for their family. And it's okay to love that. And that's just going back to you just prioritizing your money instead of being like, you can never shop or you can never buy things that you want, or you can never go to Target. I would refuse budgeting entirely if you told me I could never go to Target. Oh yeah. I mean, but it's the same thing with you with food. If you were to tell someone that they could never have a dessert again, don't you ever eat a cookie? Don't you ever have a candy bar? What would they do? They'd be like, I'm not doing this at all. That yeah. sounds awful, you know? So it's the exact same thing. You're allowed treats. Just, you know, don't go crazy. You know, have mm-hmm. some kind of a little bit of balance in there. And that's, it's that simple. Yes. Yeah. Balance, intentionality. Oh my gosh. This is so good. So much good information. <laughs> I am so inspired now. I am actually going to go work on my budget. Not right yeah. after this, but like this evening <laughs> because I know I need to do it. And it's it's just inspired me to, to revisit a couple things. So I love this so much. So do you have any maybe last pieces of advice or encouragement for the woman listening who wants to get out of debt? She wants to save for that big thing, or she just wants to get a better handle on her budget. 
Yeah. So first of all, you know, like I said earlier about get your heart right, get your mind right, write out your goals. You know, I, a lot of, where do you want to be in 10 years? And I love 10 years because it gives us enough time to dream a little crazy. Anything is possible in 10 years, right? So where do we want to be in 10 years? And then how can we work backwards to get to where we are? If you're like, no, I want to be in this a, a different career in 10 years. I want to be traveling in 10 years. I want to be running this business in 10 years. Okay, well, how can we work backwards and start to make intentional steps today, this week, this month, this year, in the next year, in the next five years, you know, and slowly kind of work backwards from those 10 year goals. Um, And really, when we do that, again, like we get excited, we have purpose, we have fire, we have that magic that lights us up, we have a reason to care about these numbers in the first place. So that is really the first and like what you said about the magic and money course, that's basically what we do in the magic and money course we give you that spark for life again. And, and that is like, it, it actually, these numbers actually matter when you, you have those things to be excited about. Yes. And I love that your whole business is, it's a sunny side up life. You are looking yeah. at this from this positive perspective where it isn't we're going on a budget to crack down and to make our lives miserable. It's we are doing this in order to open up these opportunities in our life. And what do I want my life to look like in 10 years? So such a good perspective. This has been so, so great. So I have three fun final little questions I love to ask. But before that, I want to make sure that my listeners can connect with you and find out more about how to work with you, your courses, your one-on-one coaching, and your you know, your budgeting spreadsheets and all that stuff. So where can they find you? Yeah. So you can basically find everything that you need at a sunny side up life.com. And I have, you know, my, I have tons of freebies. I do have a paid course about budgeting. I have a paid mini course that's called control your crazy. And it's a little bit more into your home and your goals and your mindset and things like that. Um, and I also offer one-on-one coaching. So I will be opening up more spots. So I do like a, I do like a 12 week coaching program. So it opens and closes a lot. Um, and of course I'm all over social media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I do two, um, YouTube videos a week. I have a weekly podcast. I'm on Pinterest. I'm all over the place. Um, so if someone listening is interested in doing the coaching spots and they're currently closed, you know, make sure to get on my newsletter list, make sure to follow me on Instagram. So you guys can know when those coaching spots are opening up. And I love the end of the year slash beginning of the year. That is where I thrive. So like October to January is we're setting new goals. We're getting excited. So I offer a lot of free workshops. I offer, you know, different things for the new year. So anyone listening that wants to like get really into it in the new year, make sure to follow me on Instagram and sign up for my newsletter. So you don't miss any of all of that. Cause it's going to be so good. It's, it's so good. Yes. Oh my gosh. You, you really do offer so many so resources. Much. <laughs> so, so great. They are definitely going to be able to find what they need when they go to all, all of the places. So I will link to all of that in the show notes. I so, so appreciate you coming on. This has been awesome. Um, so I want to just do my last little three sort of rapid fire questions. I call them rapid fire. And then I always tell my guests, you can take as long as you want with them. So because I love to share about food in a way that is joyful and balanced, I like to ask a couple things about food and cooking. So the first question is, what is your favorite thing to cook? Well, honestly, basically not very many things because I really don't enjoy cooking, but I do have my chili that I make and I love to make it because it is super simple and everyone loves it. So it makes me feel like I actually have some skills in the kitchen. (laughs) So anything that is simple, uh, that is my go-to. I bet you have more skills in the kitchen than you think you do. You are cooking for a family of five. I don't have the patience in the kitchen. Let's put it that way. And my husband works offshore. So I have three weeks of cooking with no help. (laughs) And I'm like, I I would rather be doing someone's budget or making a YouTube video. I don't really have the patience to cook. So anything simple, anything that I can like leave on a slow cook while I'm also cleaning the dishes or mopping the floor or something. That's me. <laughs> yes. And I love chili. Chili is great. It's a, it's a family favorite in our house as well. Yes. 
So then what is your favorite thing to order if you're going out to eat or have someone else cook for you? So I love mm, a good cheeseburger or a good like grilled chicken sandwich, like anything you can put with fries and like a nice sweet tea. That is me. Mm, So good. I am a cheeseburger girl too. (laughs) So good. (laughs) So we love sharing here on the podcast uh, about finding balance from every area of life when it comes to food. We just talked about balance when it comes to finances, mom life. So what does your beautiful balance mean to you? I think not having a perfect life and letting that be okay But knowing that if you were to zoom out and look at your life as a whole, that you would be really happy with it and you would feel in alignment with it and that you would be pursuing your dreams and feeling like you're in your purpose. And even when the days feel hard and you feel messy, if you were to zoom out and look at your life, are you in the whole living in your purpose and chasing your dreams? And so that's, that's me. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. What a perfect place to end. (laughs) That's so beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Sammy. This was great and so much good information. I know that I am inspired to go and work on my budget and I'm sure the women listening are as well. And if they are still, if they're in the place where they're like, okay, I need some help. At least they now know where to go and where to get some help and how to start moving forward. So thank you so much for taking the time and being here with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. If you loved it, would you take a screenshot and share it with a friend over on Instagram and tag me in it? It helps me so much to know what you love and are taking away from each episode. If you really loved it, would you hop over to iTunes and give me a star rating and review? Every rating and review helps this podcast be seen and heard by more women who need to hear the message of balance and wellness without deprivation. It's the best free gift you could give me. And as a reminder, the information and opinions on this podcast are meant for education and inspiration only and are not to be taken as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please consult with a trusted practitioner before making any changes. Have a beautiful day, friend, and I'll see you in the next episode.